Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. All right, welcome everybody to today's program, High Risk and Breast Cancer. The first installment of this series focuses on Breast Cancer 101. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Uh, we're gonna let a few more folks in from the waiting room, but again, welcome. And while we wait for um, a few more to join us, if you wanna go ahead and use that program chat box to let us know how you heard about today's program, and everyone will be on mute for the duration of today's um, event, but you can enter questions into this program chat box that'll be uh, answered during the Q&A at the end of the program. And as a reminder, this is the first installment of a three-part series. So next week, we'll be talking about breast cancer genetics and the following week, nutrition. So of course, we invite you to join us for the two remaining installments of the series. If you have registered for today's program, which obviously you have, um, you will get the link for those two other events in a reminder email. So no need to re-register. Um, you will receive those in your inbox. And if you know anybody who is unable to join today's live event, as a reminder, this program will be recorded and we will send out a recording of the event. You can also find it on our website, cscatlanta.org. We have a video library tab where you can find recordings of past programs. We have some stress reduction classes there and some great nutrition videos as well. So I do encourage you to visit cscatlanta.org and uh, checking out that video library tab. All right, I'll keep letting um, people in as they join us, but I think we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everybody to today's program, High Risk and Breast Cancer. This is the first installment, again, of a three-part series, and today is Breast Cancer 101. I'm Katie Armsby with Cancer Support Community Atlanta. If this is your first time joining us for a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we welcome you. I do invite you to visit that website, cscatlanta.org, where you can see a complete list of the virtual and in-person oncology programs offered at no cost. We have some uh, great support groups that meet virtually and in person led by licensed mental health professionals. I want to highlight we have a breast cancer support group that meets two times a month and a family and friend support group that also meets. And we have a monthly nutrition seminar that's led by an oncology dietitian with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute some stress reduction classes like yoga and tai chi, and then of course education programs like these. So for more information or to register for any of those programs, again, please visit cscatlanta.org. And if you do wanna check out our video library where we have recordings of past programs and some options for stress reduction classes, you can click that video library tab. As a reminder, everybody will be on mute for the duration of today's program, but we do invite you to enter questions into the program chat box, which will be answered at the end of the program. And I am excited to welcome Emily Beard back um, to this virtual platform. She has been kind enough to do past programs with us, and we're happy to have her back. Emily Beard is the program coordinator overseeing breast cancer, the breast cancer program development at Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. 
with a bachelor's degree in nursing from Emory and certifications in oncology nursing and breast cancer care, Emily has worked as a nurse navigator, patient advocate, and program coordinator. She has a special interest in metastatic breast cancer and developing initiatives for young people with cancer, specifically in the areas of hereditary cancer, fertility preservation, and sexuality and intimacy. So welcome, Emily, and I'll pass it off to you guys to get the program started. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. This program is near and dear to my heart. This is um, a labor of love. I feel like we've been working on this for a long time. So um, being able to introduce our high-risk program and our wonderful provider, Kiana Olson, to you is just a great pleasure. So um, you're going to learn a lot. It's it's a great topic. And we look forward to the next couple of weeks just diving deeper into this. So um, I will, without further ado, introduce Kiana. Um, Kiana, I think we have a slide for you. So <laughs> there she is. So Kiana is um, is a certified family nurse practitioner. She um, uh, graduated from Clayton State with her bachelor's and then completed her master's at Brunel. She's worked in primary care and uh, breast care. So she comes with a wealth of experience, both um, in sort of general medicine as well as um, specific to cancer care. So um, she was the perfect person to help us get this program up off the ground last year. She came to Northside in October um, and is uh, the high-risk program clinical coordinator as well as the provider that sees patients in the clinic. Um, outside of work, she stays really busy with her two beautiful baby girls, um, and she and her husband and family love to travel. So um, I think they're looking forward to some trips later this year, put a stamp on the baby's passport. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, I will hand over this presentation to Kiana. Um, she's got, again, just a, a wealth of knowledge and information to share with us. So I'm going to go off camera and hand it over to you, Kiana. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Katie. Um, I thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm thrilled to discuss the topic of high risk um, breast cancer. This is a subject that I'm deeply passionate about as I believe uh, it doesn't receive adequate at attention. Um, my goal is to educate all of you on understanding your risk and, um, and, um, uh, and being aware of additional options available for you. This topic also often brings uh, about significant anxiety among women before I begin this presentation, uh, I want to emphasize that while we can assess a patient's risk extensively, we cannot predict who will develop cancer. My intention is not to escalate your anxiety today. Uh, as healthcare professionals, we lack a crystal ball that um, uh, can foretell cancer development, but we strive to offer uh, more choices for those at higher risk. It's important to note that um, being at high risk is um, uh, not equal to having cancer. Uh, you can be considered high risk by your our measures and still never develop cancer. Um, this presentation aims to empower you and um, to advocate for yourself and um, not elevate your anxiety level. Um, um, before we begin, I wanted to remind you that this is a three-part series. Um, today, we will start by discussing breast cancer risk. Um, next week, our genetic counselor team, Hakeem, will present on genetic mutation in the high-risk population. And Savannah Duffy will conclude the series by discussing nutrition. Uh, she will help you understand how nutrition can play a role in reducing your risk for cancer. Nutrition is a powerful tool. Um, so today's objective, um, um, first we're gonna go over a statistic, risk factors for breast cancer, lifestyle modifications to reduce your risk, screening strategies for uh, high-risk patients, and also uh, high-risk program um, criteria. And um, so, um, as Emily and Katie mentioned, I'm the clinical coordinator of uh, high-risk program at Northside Hospital. Our program design is designed to assist high-risk breast cancer patients. Towards the end of our presentation, 
uh, I will provide an explanation of who could be excellent candidate for a program uh, and outline the referral criteria. So we're gonna go over the statistic of breast cancer globally. Um, breast cancer uh, is the most common cancer in uh, women worldwide, accounting for 25% of all cancer cases among women. In 2020, an estimated 2.3 million new cases of breast cancer was diagnosed globally. Breast cancer incidence rates vary across regions, and unfortunately, the rates found to be higher in North America, Europe, and Australia. Survival rate for breast cancer has significantly improved uh, throughout the years, and it's amazing. Five years relative survival rate for a localized breast cancer is about 99%, so we almost can cure it when we find it locally. And, and when it's in the same region, the survival rate is 85%. And when it's metastasized and is in distant regions of body is 28% the survival rate. So you see what how important it is to catch breast cancer early and um, get to that 99% survival rate. So uh, a statistic in US, breast cancer is most common cancer among uh, American women, except for skin cancer. Every year we diagnose 287,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer, and also 51,000 uh, cases of non-invasive or in-situ breast cancer. Breast cancer is the leading cause of death related for uh, women ages 20 to 59 years old. And on average, every two minutes, a woman diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States. Like as we talk about this, like as we talk about this topic for the next hour, 60 women will get a diagnosis of breast cancer. So basically one in eight women will get breast cancer sometimes in their lifetime, um, like in United States. So um, it can affect anybody, but luckily uh, it's treatable now. So risk factors, um, the following list that you see are the risk factors for breast cancer, family history, race, ethnicity, gender, reproductive history, lifestyle factors, history of LCIS, ADH or ALH, number of prior biopsies, mammogram breast density and other factors. We are gonna go over each one of those and explain exactly why this is a risk factor and how you can change if it's modifiable or not, and how can we um, like evaluate somebody's risk. So number one risk, I believe, is just being a woman. It's a major risk for every, like only 1% of breast cancer happen in men. 99% happens in women. Just being a woman in puts us at an uh, uh, increased risk. The next thing is family history. Uh, fami although family history is important and it plays a big part in calculating risk, I want you to uh, uh, pay attention that 70% of breast cancer happens in people with no family history and it's just sporadic. Five to 10% of breast cancer happens in um, people who, like we find the genetic mutation, we know that genetic mutation caused their cancer. And then 15 to 25%, like which you see the green part of the chart, um, we like, we see breast cancer runs in the family. A lot of people get it, but um, after we do genetic testing, we don't find the genetic mutation. So we believe in those families, they are still very high risk, even though like, let's say like a mother has breast cancer, gets genetic testing done negative, like, and all the uh, kids are negative. Um, but we see like there is a pattern in that family. We believe that multiple genes probably are involved in their cancer. We believe that some share, style, share lifestyle behaviors and env environmental factors could increase their risk for cancer. So 
negative genetic testing always doesn't mean that someone is not at risk for breast cancer. Negative genetic testing is very helpful when your um, relative who had cancer and um, like tested positive and then you are negative. That means their cancer was caused by a genetic mutation that you didn't inherit and then you are not at high risk. But um, as I said, a lot of times we fall into this familial category and a small portion are genetic mutation. Uh, I'm gonna touch base very like, um, like just a little summary, what are genes, but really our sec the second part of the series, Tim is gonna explain uh, all about genes and genetics of uh, high-risk breast cancer. Uh, genes are the basic units of hereditary, heredity passed from parent to child. Genes are made of sequences of DNA and are arranged one after another at a specific location on chromosomes to, in the nucleus of cells. To make an easier analogy and understand it better, genes are like a recipe book for our body. Um, this is the instruction that body has how to develop protein and function for everything, metabolism, um, to prevent cancer, everything happens with our genes. If there is a change in those genes, the final product or that protein is going to be different. And as we know, in humans, we have over 20,000 genes and 4,000-ish are associated with human diseases. So um, it's um, um, like we can have mutation that cause, can cause serious diseases. Let's say we something main major uh, change happens in that recipe, like we want to make cookies and we substitute flour for cement, that's gonna cause a major disease versus like we forget the baking powder. So uh, like some genetic mutation doesn't cause a significant difference. So a genetic mutation, as I said, is a change in the DNA se sequence that uh, it could um, produce something different. If it's a big enough change, it can cause a disease. Increasing age is the other factor for uh, breast cancer. As we know, as we get older, abnormal changes happen in our cells and DNA. And um, when many of these changes occur, cancer can develop. The median age of diagnosis for breast cancer in wom for women in US is 63 and for men is uh, 68. Uh, race and ethnicity role plays a part in breast cancer. Um, among younger women, African-American women have higher rate of breast cancer. And among older women, non-Hispanic white women have higher rate of breast cancer. And in African-American women, we see higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer. This is more common in African-American women. And um, how do we explain triple negative? Like cancer cells have receptors. Um, like they can have receptors to hormones. And when we uh, have those receptors, the cancer is more treatable and we have more options to offer the patients. But when it's triple negative, like we don't have these receptors. And unfortunately, those type of cancers are more aggressive and also five years recurrence rate is higher. And this we see it more often in patients with genetic mutations and African-American women. Um, we get to race and ethnicity, why does that matter? Like for example, in Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, um, we see higher incidence of BRCA1 and 2 mutation. In general population, we have one in 400 people testing positive for BRCA1 and 2 mutation. But in Ashkenazi Jewish, we see one in 40. So it's a lot more prevalent genetic mutation. Um, then um, we talk about reproductive history. Um, so um, younger age and menarche, older age at menopause, uh, not having live birth, uh, older age at first um, live birth or not breastfeeding could affect us. And we're gonna go to detail of each of this. 
Uh, so why early menarche and late menopause can increase our risk for breast cancer? Um, they've done studies and they saw that women who begin their period before age 11 have about 15 to 20% higher breast cancer compared to those who begin their period at age 15 or older. And I have to emphasize this is 15 to 20% relative risk, not overall risk. And women who go through menopause after age 55 have a 40% um, higher risk of breast cancer cons compared to women who do not, uh, who do have their, like, their period stops at uh, age 45 or younger. Uh, again, this is relative risk. So why early men menarche and late menopause um, like, like attribute to our risk? Basically, we think that the longer we have the reproductive age going, like it starts early and goes later, our body is exposed to more estrogen. And exposure of more estrogen to our body, it means it increases the risk for breast cancer. Pregnancy. So during pregnancy, there are several hypotheses about pregnancy. Number one, we know like having kids before um, 30, it helps us to reduce our risk. But also when pregnancy happens, um, during pregnancy, breast cells grow more rapidly. And if there is any genetic damage in breast cell before pregnancy, it's like copied through the cell growth. And this, in like the genetic mutation can um, keep going forward and it can cause increased risk for breast cancer. So there are hypotheses that saying that like, you know, 10 years after pregnancy, we can be at a slight increase for breast cancer. But uh, we know having live childbirth before 30, it increases, it decreases our risk and also breastfeeding, it, it uh, decreases our risk. And I'm going to explain next couple of slides that why uh, like that, this is another hypothesis and we believe this is the reason. So in early pregnancy, a marked increase uh, in ductal spreading, which is like the small branches in the breast happens and also lobular formation happens. And our um, breast lobules uh, like gets to a, a mature level. Like when uh, with the start of puberty and sexual maturity, we have type one and type two lobule. During pregnancy and lactation, these lobules mature to be to the next level, like type three and type four. We know that type one and type two lobules, they are um, more susceptible to carcinogens. Carcinogens are factors that could cause um, cancer. So like having a pregnancy and breastfeeding, having pregnancy before age 30 and breastfeeding could reduce our risk. Breastfeeding has been shown to have a protective effect in many studies. And for every 12 months of breastfeeding, relative risk for breast cancer decreases by 4.3%. And this could kind of explain that why, like in Western countries, we have uh, like more incidence of breast cancer versus in poorer country who women have like earlier childbirth, more alive childbirth. And um, actually they go on for breastfeeding for like, like one to two years or more. They have less, like their breast cancer risk actually is decreased. Um, prior thoracic radiation therapy, this is another thing that increases our risk for breast cancer. Women with prior thoracic radiation therapy between ages 10 to 30 are at significant risk for breast cancer. Those treated with radiation therapy have a three to seven times higher risk for breast cancer. And um, this is uh, one of the NCCN guidelines like without even calculation of risk, if somebody had radiation therapy between those ages, um, they should be considered high risk and they should be at elevated surveillance. Um, this could happen in women who had, you know, 
black thyroid cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, they get radiation to the chest area, like it put them at risk. And they've looked at it and why this is happening. And they found that sometimes a genetic mutation happens in those younger ages when we're before 30. So the genetic mutation that happens in our uh, DNA, it can lead us to have more incident of breast cancer as a, cause, as a result of radiation therapy. A history of multiple biopsies. We know that women who go undergo multiple bio, uh, breast biopsies over time may have a, a slight increase um, in, in chance for breast cancer. It's unclear why, even though like the result is benign, it's still the risk increases slightly. Um, I have to uh, emphasize that doing biopsies does not increase anybody's risk for breast cancer. But we know in general, when you have history of multiple biopsies, you just it shows that you just have a more active breast tissue and um, like you, it puts you at a slight increase for, you know, and in the risk calculation, but doing biopsies doesn't cause any kind of breast cancer. History of abnormal breast biopsies, such as ALH, ADH, LCIS, those are like abbreviation, but atypical lobular hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, and uh, lobular carcinoma in situ. These lesions are associated with increased risk for developing breast cancer. I included this picture to kind of explain, because I know like um, a lot of women get diagnosed with this and, um, they are not sure what it is. So if you look at the more far left um, um, cells, those are the, like uh, cells in a normal duct. Our breasts are made of two different cells, like lobular cells and ductal cells. So as you see in the normal duct, the cells are sitting very organized. They look great. None of them look different than others. The next picture shows the hyperplasia. Um, still cells are normal. They just like, you know, like we have two stack on one row. Um, this is very normal. Every woman hyper has hyperplasia in their um, uh, breast is a part of the growth. And, you know, the vision of cells is fine. But when it gets to the atypical, you see the cells are changing uh, kind of their character. They're not quite cancer, but they don't look like normal neither. So this is the case of atypical uh, ductal hyperplasia. And as you see in the next level, we have the DCIS, the cancer cells are happening. Those are cancer cells, but they are contained in the duct. They are not out of the duct. And in the last picture you see is the invasive cancer when the cancer cells um, like are breaking out of the duct and um, they're leaving the duct and going to the neighbor cells. So. Um, as a result, when somebody has atypical hyperplasia, either ductal or lobular or LCIS, we consider them at high risk for breast cancer because we know they're in that process of change. Breast density. This is a hot topic, and I know we had some questions um, uh, that, like, and everybody's, like, uh, during past few years, you like, there was laws in place in Georgia that uh, radiology department needs to tell you about your breast density. And, and it's very confusing. What does it mean? Like my mammogram is normal, but it says I'm dense. Um, so I want to cl uh, clarify all the questions about breast density. And hopefully after this, you understand it very well. Um, breast density is not related to firmness of the breast or nobody can, like no doctor can do a breast exam and tell you your breast is dense or not. The breast density is only like we see it on mammogram or MRI. We, and this is how we determine a breast is dense or not dense. Basically, it's proportion of breast tissue to fat. As you see, the uh, far left picture is completely gray. This is a completely fatty breast. Only 10% of women have completely fatty breasts. This breast, um, if cancer happens on this um, imaging, uh, shows white. So you can see how 
see through and how easy it will be to detect cancer in that fatty breast. Next level is the scattered breast. And this is a very simplified pictures. A scattered breast could have more scattered, you know, areas of breast density, like white densities. But um, like, as you see, like we have a more like some fat and some uh, breast tissue. The next level is heterogeneously dense breast. And the last level is, um, is the extremely dense breast. Again, only 10% of women happen to have the extremely dense, dense breast. Uh, like they're 80% fall into the scattered or fibro, fibroglandular density. Um, but as you see, the last one, which is the extremely dense breast, is it could mask cancer because cancer appears white on the imaging and, um, you know, like the breast density appears white. So many, many variables are involved in breast density. One of them is genetic, age, hormone usage, body fat. All those plays a factor. So... 50 to 60 percent of women under age, um, like between age 40 to 44, have dense breasts, especially if they're fit. That means they don't have a lot of fat and and their breast is young with all the hormones they have. So they're going to have like, like, so this is a large portion of population, right? Um, 20 to 30 percent of women ages 70 to 74 have dense breasts. This is where the genetics comes in play. Like some women, we don't know why, but they keep their density. A lot of women after um, they go to menopause, the density and the hormones kind of go down. The density goes down, but um, I've had 70, 80 year old women who come to my office and they have extremely dense breasts and they, their density never changes. So part of it is really genetic. Um, hormone usage, I um, uh, added that because in one third of cases when uh, women start hormone replacement therapy, um, their breast becomes denser. If they are heterogeneously dense, they go to extremely dense. If they are scattered, they go to heterogeneously dense. So they become dense. So, um, and the part that I said that density could mask abnormalities on mammogram like i don't want to over worry you because this is like 20 percent really difference between fatty and extremely dense like it's still like our radiologists are experienced and they can still see it but it's a little bit harder to read mammogram uh, and in general women who have very dense breasts which was the last slide the 10 percent population we know that they are significantly higher risk for breast cancer, up to four times compared to women who have fatty breasts, which is, again, that's 10% of the population. So, and the, what we have learned through research, it looks like women who have, we haven't understood it completely, but it looks like women who have um, like very dense breasts, they just have more activated breast tissue and it's they're just more poor, prone to cancer beside the factor of masking and we can read it. So it's just more active breast tissue. Um, alcohol consumption, uh, we know that even a small amount of alcohol is linked with increased uh, risk of breast can cancer. Uh, alcohol, and I'm going to explain what happens with alcohol consumption, why it increases our risk. So alcohol changes the way a woman's body metabolizes estrogen and leads to rise up estrogen level. And anytime we have more estrogen, we're going to have more incidence of breast cancer. Uh, alcohol can be converted to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde can damage the DNA inside our cells over the time and years. Also, alcohol can affect the body's ability to absorb nutrition such as folate. And folate deficiency can affect breast and colorectal cancer. Um, we, our body actually needs the folate to stay healthy. Our cells um, need the folate to repair themselves. Also, alcohol consumption in excessive alcohol consumption uh, can also affect body weight and, and can increase BMI. So there have been a lot of recommendations, like, you know, one a day. Definitely as women, we have lower, like our body um, 
can tolerate alcohol less and you know we we cannot drink as much as a man uh, like um, the recommendation used to be two for men and um, one for women like one alcoholic drink per day I say keep it as low as you can if you like if you can keep it to four a week that will be great uh, still we have to you know pick our battles and see what makes us happy but definitely alcohol could increase the risk for cancer um increased bmi there is association between high bmi and increased risk for breast cancer in postmenopausal women uh, increased fat increases circulating endogenous estrogen level and again that can cause breast cancer now we all know that you know more estrogen more exposure to estrogen could increase our risk for breast cancer. Exercise has also been shown to reduce the risk for breast cancer, especially in postmenopausal women. Um, so now we get to the top, now that we understand all the factors and what can, like what factors are uh, increasing or re reducing our risk for breast cancer, now how do we calculate somebody's risk for breast cancer? Because if we know and understand this, it, it helps us. So risk assessment uh, for breast cancer can be really helpful for women because it allows them to understand their personal risk of developing the disease. Risk assessment tools takes into account all the various factors that we talked about and all women should have risk assessment done by age 25, ideally. Where can you get your risk assessment done? primary care or OBGYN offices, genetic counselors, bre breast health clinics, high-risk clinics. And I included this online assessment tool if you want to take a picture. Th this is one of the best one I found that is pretty easy to plug in your information. And uh, if you know your breast density, put it in. And actually it gives you kind of an estimate, a rough estimate, but it's a good tool to use. And um, really, in like um, primary care and OBGYN offices, it will be ideal if they start, you know, doing the risk assessment. But we know that they're, you know, they're in their 15, 20 minutes time. This doesn't happen often. Uh, but, you know, like I know breast health clinics, high risk clinic, genetic counselors, in those places, you always get risk assessment done. Uh, risk assessment tools. So there are many models that in, like, you know, um, calculates um, breast cancer risk. Like we have like some older models, Gale, Claus, Tyracusic is one of the most newest one and also most comprehensive one. And the reason I like the Tyracusic the most because it considers all these factors that we discussed, but not all the calculated like for example, Claus mother only does family history or Gale mother considers biopsy and some family history, but doesn't like go to hormone replacement therapy. So Tyracusic model almost takes, like considers all these risk factors that we talked about. And the link that I sh shared with you, it uh, almost like is like the, is a simplified Tyracusic model. A uh, woman who, so now who is high risk? Like, let's say you go to the link, you put your risk and uh, what number is high, what number is high? General population, if you remember, we said one in eight women gets breast cancer. So general population risk for breast cancer is 12%. If NCCN guideline said um, that if you have above 20% lifetime risk, you're considered at high risk for breast cancer. And this number is important because it gives you more options for the screening and like as far as insurance like coverage. Um, recommendation for average risk woman for a screening is annual screening mammography starting at age 40. Also, you need to see a healthcare provider for a clinical breast exam every year, once a year, and also breast awareness. So uh, this is a topic and I want to touch base really quick. Um, we used to say back in the days that uh, you need to check your breast once a month. Remember, like check for a lump, um, do it after your period or some day of the month. But I like I've been in healthcare for many, many years and um, 
been talking to women for many, many years, like most of the time I hear that, you know, first of all, I forget. There is a small population who say, I'm very familiar with my breasts. I do it once a month. Good for them. Continue doing it. But there are a lot of women who say, I don't know what I'm checking for. It feels so lumpy. And I forget, like, that's the truth. So now they have changed the guideline to breast awareness, which means every day you take a shower, take a bath, feel it, touch it, kind of like make sure that your breast feels the day before. And um, and like when you before you dress, look at your breast, look how it's hanging, look at your nipple, nipple. Does it look like the day before? So just be aware of your breast and be familiar with how it looks like and how it feels like high-risk cancer screening so what so like now we talked about average so if you're high risk what is your options the um this is very simplified it doesn't apply to different genetic mutations people with genetic mutation each one is different like the age can be different but if you just high risk i mean you don't have any genetic mutation, the recommendation is to start a screening 10 years prior to the youngest family member was diagnosed with breast cancer um, or um, to the age of 30, like, or begin at 40. We do not start mammography before age of 30 because we don't want to expose a screening mammography unless there is a diagnostic case that like there is a um, um, there is like a palpable lump, we do mammography, but before age 30, we don't do a screening mammography. Uh, we start after 30, um, like 10 years prior to your youngest relative was diagnosed or begin at 40. We start MRI 10 years prior to uh, when youngest relative was diagnosed um, not prior to age 25. If there is one case of genetic mutation. We start at 20, but most of the time we start at 25 or 10 years younger, or we start at age 40. Consider contrast enhanced mammography or a whole breast ultrasound when MRI you, uh, patient cannot go under MRI. Also breast awareness, same thing that we explained in the last is, ex slide. And for genetic mutation, again, we, is different. So um, now, uh, like here at high risk clinic, how it works, we, before the patient comes to our clinic, we send them a survey, we collect all the personal and family history, which is very thorough and precise. And based on that, we calculate patients uh, on different risk models. And as you see, if they are above 20% on anti-acoustic version eight, we recommend them like the elevated screening. So the services offered in our clinic, basically patient comes, we assess their risk, and we tell them, we show them kind of more options. And we, we want to be here for you that, you know, um, you understand your risk really well, and you know, what are your options? Because what we see in primary care and um, um, GYN offices, not all these options are offered. Um, so like when the risk is above 20% and the patient is willing to and is wants to go through elevated screening, we offer them mammography and breast MRI six months apart. Also in our clinic, we kind of start the discussion about prophylactic procedures. This is not appropriate for every patient, but in cases that patients have genetic mutations, prophylactic procedures could be considered. Uh, chemo prevention is another way to reduce risk, especially for patients who have a history of atypical cells. Uh, it can help them significantly. We start the discussion and like explain that what are the side effects? Uh, is it appropriate for you? Should you consider that? Because um, some of the chemoprophylaxis medications could decrease the risk for breast cancer up to 46%. But obviously, it could have side effects. But um, not side effect doesn't happen in every patient. And um, like I think in some cases, they're very appropriate. And it, uh, patients should give it a try to reduce their chance for breast cancer. We also offer coordination of genetic testing, offer patients genetic testing, and also every visit 
um, we talk uh, we talk about lifestyle modifications. This is um, like focus on nutrition counseling. Our licensed dietitian Savannah talk to every patient comes to our clinic, and they get two complimentary um, visits with Savannah because after we tell you you're high risk, we want to utilize you with all the um, with everything you can do to reduce your risk, either through nutrition or getting you approved for MRI, breast MRI. Um, so like we can elevate your surveillance. And year after year, we follow up with these patients, we order their imaging, we follow up their imaging, we do the breast, one breast exam in the clinic and they get another breast exam uh, with their primary care or GYN. So ideally when I detect somebody who is high risk, I would like for them to go through like a breast exam every six months and some sort of breast imaging every six months. One time mammogram, one time MRI. And um, as we discussed, like a lot of these patients have been breast and um, like uh, doing MRI and mammogram is very appropriate for them. So we um, don't miss anything on the imaging and we cannot like the um, uh, density doesn't mask the cancer. So this is our phone number and email address. If you're interested to like, if you know, like based on the presentation that we had today, you kind of, um, if you see that you might be at high risk, you can always uh, contact this phone number or email us at highriskcancer at northside.com. And we will be happy to answer your questions, tell you um, if you could come to this clinic and get evaluated and maybe, and stay on the um, increased surveillance path. Um, I know there was a few questions. Um, I Sarah. hope I answered it. Yeah, but um, <laughs> please. <laughs> thank you so much thank for you. your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow, what a, um, we knew this was, would be informative. Um, that was a lot of information and just delivered really, really well. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump right into a couple questions that we got from audience members. Um, well, we had gotten a few ahead of time as well, so I'm going to just um, go ahead and start um, with these. Kiana, um, a participant was asking who had just recently finished radiation treatment, does, does just having finished treatment mean that she has a higher risk of recurrence? Can you answer that question? I think maybe this is related to the question about... Um, previous treatment um, yes, and, I, and how that puts, puts you at risk for? I think treatment. it was, I kind of mentioned it. If you, the radiation treatment was done in the chest area, let's say like thyroid cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, like it was done to the chest area, um, it could increase the risk for like, and it was between ages 10 to 30 because they looked and they found out that like, and when it happens between those ages, there is higher chance to um, increase, like to have, like um, it could cause some sort of genetic mutation and they can be at risk for breast cancer. So if it's after 30, less. And then the other thing I wanted to touch base is back in the days, the radiation therapy was less precise and it was like, uh, you know, um, much stronger and it was causing more cancer. Now they're like perfecting this and it's the risk going down is not as much. But if you had chest radiation between 10 to 30, you definitely, by definition, you are high risk and you should be on MRI and mammogram screening. So for the... Um... Another question, and this is a different patient asking, but this is a little bit related to, to recommendations. Um, this person's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, not at Northside. So how would, how would she first identify whether that maternal breast cancer put her at risk and elevated risk? And then how would she potentially become a patient Absolutely. at Northside for the so, um, Very good question. Um, so if you're interested, you can either call the phone number or email us at highriskcancer um, at norsa.com, like the email I shared, and um, like we will be glad to help you. Really, like 
there are a lot of factors. It's hard for me to say that you definitely will be high risk or not. May, number one thing is like, what was the age of mother? And if there was other family members in the paternal side or maternal side who had cancer, there is a myth that like only maternal family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer can affect us, but not really is we get half of our genes from our father, half of our genes from our mother. So like, as you saw, so many things are involved in calculation of risk. And like, I highly recommend to this uh, audience that um, who just come for one visit, if they're not high risk, we're not gonna keep them in this clinic or use that um, online calculator and just see like if, if she's close to the 20 person or not. Come to the clinic, we calculate it. If she is not above 20%, uh, we can still show them some more options. Let's say if they're very dense breasts, like, you know, there is an option of fast MRI. So um, I say she should have risk calculation done. And I cannot say on top of my mind that because everything plays a role, even age of right. menopause, menopause sure. childbirth, everything, and the age of mother is a very big role. Definitely. There's so many, there's so many, um, I mean, that's what makes it fascinating, but also makes it challenging, right? To, to that's develop fine. sort of well, specific yes, personal, but personal recommendations. Um, I had a question and this is specific um, to kind of modalities that we use to, to screen. Um, this is about whether a whole breast screening ultrasound is part of what we offer for high risk screening. We do not. And there is a reason we don't do that. Um, so. You know, they've done research like um, about MRI, mammogram, uh, ultrasound. We know that breast MRIs could de- like could help us with dense breasts a little bit, but not significantly and produces a lot of false positive results. What does it mean? It means we do the ultrasound, we find benign, um, like benign things, and we don't know what they are. It's not clear. So we proceed with the biopsy. And we put the patient through the anxiety and everything. And at the end is nothing. So it's not very precise. So they've done like, uh, there was a study in Korea. A lot of women apparently, as we talked, density could be genetics, right? A lot of women have dense breasts there. So they put 769 women through just um, like through um, mammogram and uh, ultrasound. They were able to catch a couple more cancer which is good, but 169 women went under unnecessary biopsies. To put this in perspective, if you put 1,000 women under like just mammogram, you may catch five cancer. If you add ultrasound, you may catch two more. If you add MRI, you get 15 cancer diagnosis. And the rate of false positive uh, rate for MRIs is much, much lower. That's why even if you're not high risk at Northside, we offer you fast MRI for price of $3.95. And um, like, you don't have to, like you can do the fast MRI and get the like extra layer of um, assurance, but you don't have to do the ultrasound, which can cause a lot of biopsies. Thank you. I think that's really important because I, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and um, you know, our program has developed, you know, with a, a lot of input from various providers. You know, we have a multidisciplinary team working on this, so um, you know, we're trying to stay on top of the data and make sure that we're doing what's best for patients. So I appreciate right. you breaking, if, breaking it all down for us. Right. If MRI is not access, like somebody has like a cochlear implant or something that they don't, they, they can do MRI, then ultrasound is a good option. But I don't like to offer ultrasound as a first line option. For them. Yes. For a um, <clears throat> thank you so much. These are great questions. And I have a few more. So I'm going to just keep them coming until we're um, until we're out of time. But um, this is from a participant. She's asking if her annual mammogram would indicate if there was atypical hyperplasia cells. Is that something that can be can be seen on a mammogram? Yes, we we could. So yeah, yes. I, it, like it depends on the like you know like lesion, and um, like we the uh, atypical. Like it depends how big it is, where it is. Yes, it can be seen on a mammogram, but 
does MRI um, provide a better, more sensitive imaging? Yes to that. And is, for, is, yeah, for the atypical hyperplasia, it would be the biopsy would be required to know for sure that it's atypical death hyperplasia, but it would be something that would be caught on a mammogram. It would be an abnormal mammogram. That would be absolutely. And if we it. catch that on a mammogram, we usually like to offer patients MRI to make sure there is not more spots that we're not seeing on our mammogram. So MRI will provide better like imaging that we, we make sure we're not missing anything. Thank you. Um, another another participant question. So this is specific. This is a pretty specific family history. So um, just bear with me. We're talking um, about a woman who has two direct female cousins, four direct aunts, all have breast cancer, um, and all on her father's side. So she's saying these are her dad's sisters and dad's brother's daughters. So dad's side of the family, lots of cancer. Um, does this family history indicate high risk? Yes, definitely. As I said, there is a myth like out there that if your paternal side has ovarian or female part cancers, they don't give it to you. This is not right. We get half of our genes from our mother and half of our genes as our father. This is a very significant family history. And again, like the age is important, but this patient definitely will will be appropriate for genetic testing uh, because more than three people on one side of family have breast cancer. She will be uh, appropriate for genetic testing. Her family members who are affected, they will be great candidate for genetic testing. They, they are the best people to get genetic testing and patient like this uh, person herself needs to get risk evaluated and um, um, like see if she qualifies for more options. Thank you. And um, question about the risk assessment that's offered through Northside. Is it covered by insurance? Does insurance cover these um, these visits? Very good question. Yes, like our visit is just a consult with a specialist. So if you come see me, is like uh, making appointments with a specialist. You only pay a copay, like the copay that you pay to see a specialist, and we just. Um, like uh, coded like a doctor visit note. So um, yes, it will be covered. And if you are high risk, you can come see us once a year. If you're not high risk, we reassure you and you can, you'll you be good to go and just follow up with your GBI and MPCP. Um, and I've got another patient um, question. This one's a, a little specific also. So just want to give you some details. This is the patient that was treated for stage three ovarian cancer um, last year, 2021, um, by the age of 70. She doesn't have any uh, gene mutations and is currently in remission from ovarian cancer. So happy to hear that. Um, the mammogram she had back in February, she got called back for asymmetry and does have dense breasts and wondering about risk, high risk. So it sounds like I'm hearing, I'm hearing some high risk risk factors in terms of the ovarian cancer history the dense breast tissue um, as well. And the biopsy, right. The biopsy, right. So, so yeah. um, after 70, um, yes, again, it depends on her family history too. I'm glad that ovarian cancer, she already got genetic testing done. That was very appropriate. Like anybody with ovarian cancer should get genetic testing. So I'm glad her genetic testing was negative. Um, does the ovarian cancer increase her risk for breast cancer? Um, is like we when we think about ovarian cancer increasing risk for breast cancer, it's like when there is a genetic mutation that, that can cause both cancers. So in her case, it looks like she doesn't have a um, um, like mutation. Uh, still, I say she should be evaluated for risk, and considering that she had cancer and she has dense breasts. Even if she doesn't qualify for traditional MRI, she could consider the fast MRIs, which is three ninety five out of pocket. But it would be worth to get the risk assessment done and know uh, for sure that where is yeah where is she yeah. standing. At. And she's adding to you that there's additional family history. Grandmother and niece also had breast cancer. Oh, so yeah. I think also the thing I would say for this patient as well is just to educate the family, right? Because even though you don't have the genetic risk uh, or that she individually doesn't have genetic risk. Um, there could still be something going on. Absolutely. In the family. And 
you know, I think we like to always test the person who has had cancer because that person obviously has already um, proved that they're high risk for cancer. Um, But really, we also really want to get to some of these folks that are relatives because we know that they share genetic um, risk and potentially could be could be patients that we could help. Absolutely. Um, With that genetic, the, that uh, family history, it everything changes. So it's, again, very personalized for each patient. Right. You have to have it done and see if you're at elevated risk or not yet. Um, well, we could, I think, go on and on and on. <laughs> um, I feel like the questions keep coming. Um, would... Um, one more. I'm going to just finish with one. I just got one last one. Um, the doctor, uh, this patient sees the doctor at Northside. Would she still need uh, to make an appointment with us or with the clinic, with you, Kiana, to assess risk factors? So patients already being followed by a Northside uh, provider, What you know? would she need a separate appointment for risk can she Can she explain if she sees a breast specialist or just a PCP GYN? Um, I'm assuming maybe we're talking about a breast specialist. Um, it's a breast specialist. Yeah. She sees a surgeon. A surgeon. Um, well, if she is followed by a surgeon, they, they're very well educated and they kind of do the same thing. Well, they don't offer genetic testing, nutritional counseling, things like that, that our program offers, but they, I'm sure they have, um, assess her risk and, um, they're aware of her risk and doing the appropriate a surveillance. Yeah. And I would say just that, you know, there's no conflict. So if she wanted to make an appointment, come see you for a more in-depth kind of, you know, high risk analysis. Um, certainly that doesn't preclude her from going back to that surgeon or going back to be followed by the provider. The recommendations you're going to provide could be given or carried out really by any provider. So we'd love to see patients who are, you know, coming back to us year after year because we know things change and family history changes. But We'd also be very happy to have a patient come for consultation and then return to their provider that, you know, is going to provide that care for them, you know, along the continuum. It's really so personal. And I think the recommendations would, you know, would, would, um, would be likewise would, you know, would, would reflect that. So, um, um, these are so many wonderful, wonderful questions. We, um, are going to have to stop because we're out of time, but um, we really thank you for coming today to this program. I want to thank Kiana for just such a insightful, enlightening presentation. She did a wonderful job. Um, I also want to invite everybody um, to return to part two. Remember, this is part two. Um, this is part one of three. So part two is next week. We will be hearing from Tim Hackham, who is our genetic counselor, to kind of do more of a deep dive into the genetics and family history piece. Um, so we look forward to more questions and some of these that didn't get answered, we'll try to include in next week's presentation as well. There were a few that were specifically about genetic testing. So I saved those for, um, for Tim's piece next week, but, um, I just want to thank everybody again, if you have additional questions, feel free to, um, to, to send them to the, um, address that you got an email from, from cancer support community, and we can try to follow up. Um, again, thank you to Kiana and to the cancer support community for supporting this event. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.